Hey everyone, good morning. Thank you so much for being here in the new Briar and Thorn vulnerability management like a boss. Um, we promise we won't be selling anything. We appreciate you guys being here. So we're gonna we're just here to have a good time, learn something, and without further ado, I would love to introduce to our host and global CEO, Alyssa Knight. She will take care of you guys, and I promise you will have a lot of fun with her. Go ahead, Alyssa. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Albert. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you guys being here today. We are going to be talking about building a vulnerability management program like a boss. Uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Awesome. So you guys should be seeing the title screen at this point. Uh, one thing that I want to make clear to all of you that uh, we don't do sales in ours at Briar and Thorn. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of what these are, a sales in our is basically a webinar that a vendor uh, puts on and you end up just sitting in on a commercial. Uh, they're, you know, they disguise it as trying to educate you on something and it turns out that, uh, that they're really just trying to sell you their product. Uh, we're not, about that here i'm not about that for those of you who've joined us that follow me know that i don't do sales in ours and that's exactly what we are not doing today as a sales in ours so uh what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through building a vulnerability management program uh what that means today and how you might be actually doing it wrong um so uh without further ado uh we will go ahead and get started all right but first let's talk about me <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a recovering hacker. I've been doing this for about 20 years. I think we're, I think we're at 21 years at this point, um, at least the end of 2020. Uh, so I've been to the show. I've been around the block. Um, I started out as a penetration tester. Uh, typical Hollywood story. Hacked into a government network when I was 17. Got left off, let off on a technicality. Um, and uh, went to go work for the U.S. intelligence community in cyber warfare. I've started and sold multiple cybersecurity startups. Uh, Briar and Thorn is my third successful startup, and we are an MSSP. We provide network security monitoring, and that's the only advertisement that I'm going to give you today. Uh, that's basically what we do: is uh, uh, manage detection, response, and NSM. So uh, these are the ways you can connect with me. Definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm always putting on uh, weekly live broadcasts, uploading videos uploading and writing blog posts and also putting out content as a content creator for our clients. I'm also a published author. I published the first book on hacking connected cars and uh, I'm in the process of writing a new book on hacking APIs. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn and also follow me on Twitter and that's who I am. Uh, one thing that I do want to uh, make clear is I'm, I'm not this elitist where if you reach out to me uh, for help or a question uh, that I won't help you out. Uh, I, I'm all about that. Uh, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, DM me, um, and uh, I'm happy to help you. I'm happy to guide you or answer any questions that uh, you maybe, maybe you thought about after this webinar uh, and forgot to, or forgot to ask. So one of the things that <laughs> I didn't know if it was like totally arrogant to quote myself. I usually people quote other people like Aristotle or Socrates. I thought I'd quote myself, um, but whether it's arrogant or not, I thought it was funny. You can't prioritize protection when you don't know what's priority. Um, you know, Caroline, who's actually with us today. Wave hi, Caroline. Just kidding. No one can see you wave. Um, one of the things that we've found, you know, Briar and Thorne has been around for the last 10 years. We've been in, we've been in business for a decade. And over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of things. <laughs> I think we could do, Caroline, maybe we should do a webinar one of these days just on the crazy things we've seen out there uh, in very large organizations. And one of the things that is, has been very common uh, is we'll walk into a large organization and, you know, and I'm not talking about a small company, I'm talking about, you know, a, a large cap, publicly traded company, uh, that sort of thing, where all they're really doing is they've got someone running around running Quala scans or Nessa scans. Um, and 
that's it. Just running vulnerability scans and remediating the things that they can when they get support from application application developers um, or someone in infrastructure and operations. Um, it, it's very chaotic, right? And you know, really, no vulnerability management policy. Don't really know what they're scanning, what they're not scanning. They were just given cider blocks from network engineering of all of the IPs to scan. And, and I can't stress this enough how backwards that completely is, how contorted that that idea is. Because when it comes to the vulnerability scanner, your, your vulnerability management, at that point, you're just leveraging technology. You're just using technology, hoping that it doesn't produce many false positives. And vulnerability management is so much more than that. You know, and and as as I'm sure a lot of you know, today there is no there really is no remediating every vulnerability. It's it's just there's vulnerabilities that are an accepted risk by the organization and an unacceptable risk. And if you're just scanning everything, you're going to get that report. But how do you know what to prioritize? How do you know what to remediate? How do you know which vulnerabilities affect you know, business critical data or information from others when you're just looking at a scan report? You need to prioritize what it is you're actually trying to protect. So one of the things that I'm a big proponent of is the fact that no one should be running a penetration test or vulnerability scan until you've done a risk assessment. Right? Let me say that again. You shouldn't be running a vulnerability scan or performing a pen test without a risk assessment first. Why? Because especially when you're doing an asset-based risk assessment, you are defining what is acceptable and unacceptable risks to the business. You're identifying your high risk assets. I'm going to care a lot less about an eternal blue vulnerability on a workstation than I am on a server that might have shared folders on it uh, containing PII or PHI. Right? What what system are you going to remediate first? You only have a finite amount of time in your day. How do you know what system you're going to focus on? Are you going to are you going to go around trying to remediate workstations? Are you going to you know push out updates and patches for systems that? Yeah, they should be patched. I'm not saying don't you know trolls put your your guns down. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be patched. They should be patched, especially if it's Eternal Blue, but. Ideally, you want to approach it in a prioritized way where you're remediating systems that are high risk assets to the business. Right. All right. So um, <laughs> I love the photography I use in PowerPoints. Nothing, nothing to do with cybersecurity at all. That's what I love it. Love about it. All right. So what I'm presenting to you is really a bastardized version of Gartner's vulnerability management framework. Um, I've I've sort of turned it upside down. Uh, and so you'll notice some idiosyncratic dis distinctions and differences between what I'm going to present today and if you're familiar with the Gartner, Gartner framework. So the first thing that I would recommend doing is obviously prepare. Um, one of the things that you will fail at is if you try and go at anything in an enterprise alone, right? So you just got hired as a senior security engineer for an organization. There's really no one else left in, there's no one else in the team. You're one woman team or a one man team. And uh, you're you're running around as a senior security engineer and you know, you've know you been asked to perform vulnerability scanning and you know remediate the vulnerabilities that you've found. Uh, you are going to fail if you do not get the involvement and support of other people in the organization. You need to form like a splinter cell. You, you know, if you want to get all tactical and military, um, form a cell that's an interdepartmental team made up of people from systems engineering, network engineering. You know, basically, you want infrastructure and operations involved in your team. They may not be running the scans. They may not be validating it through exploitation, but they're going to be the ones to really help champion you, championing you 
getting in front of the application developers and getting in front of the system owners of the systems that you're going to want to patch. You're going to need to patch. So make sure that you're doing this as a team. This is not a security function only. This is an, a, a company-wide function. So you're going to want to get a team together uh, to really help you and, and make sure that that you're getting in front of the right people, you're getting in front of the stakeholders that matter. Next, you're going to want to select your vulnerability management technologies. And then when and I said that plural because it's not just a scanner you're going to want to budget for. Um, at the end of the day, you know, there really if you're talking about Nessus, you're talking about Nexpos, you're talking about Outposts, all of those are great vulnerability scanners. There isn't one that's better than the other. There's definitely one that's more expensive than the other, and you all know what I'm talking about. You all know what product that is. It's so expensive, it's ridiculous. But, you know, it's it's at the end of the day, it's really just a vulnerability scanner. And you don't want to just rely on, rely on that technology. You're, you're going to want to include other things in your vulnerability management program. One of the things that I'm going to talk about today is a, a completely different approach to vulnerability management to augment your scanning. I'm not saying that it should replace your vulnerability scanner, but it should augment it. And that is breach and attack simulation or BAS. So I'm going to talk about that in today's presentation, but just keep that in your back pocket that in addition to vulnerability scanning, your organization should also have a breach and attack simulation tool. And then create a freaking policy and procedure. I can't, you know, I, I don't understand. I can't fathom why people will go at something like enterprise-wide scanning and remediation and not have a policy or procedure in place. I don't get that. That doesn't compute with me. You need a policy that's signed off on uh, by senior management, granting you the powers uh, to be doing this. Um, you know, so you, in case you bring something down and another part of the organization finds out and, you know, their VP or up and they're pissed, you've got something that says, you know, from a, a preferably an officer level person that signed off on this, like your CISO, that says you can do these scans and you have the full support of the ELT or enterprise leadership team, executive leadership team. Um, so have that policy in place that also defines, you know, what are the remediation times? Who is responsible? That is a table I'm going to talk about in the next slide. But again, this policy should define everything a part, as part of, that's part of your vulnerability management program. In addition to the vulnerability policy, vulnerability management policy, you should also have a procedure. So it's rinsed and reused and done the same way repeatedly over time that you have this sort of OODA loop or plan do check act loop that's continuously being performed the same way every time. So you have repeatable results that you can repeat doing the vulnerability scanning, the vulnerability remediation, and the risk assessment and risk treatment plan the same way every time. And again, perform an asset-based risk assessment. Don't go at any vulnerability scanning or penetration testing without any kind of risk assessment behind you. Know what assets you're targeting. Know what parts of the network you're targeting. What do those assets do, right? One of the big things, you don't want to be vulnerability scanning a check printer or one of those big plotters because a vulnerability scan can cause it to start spitting out and printing paper. So, you know, just the worst possible thing, and I can't stress this enough, and I see it so much, is an organization just throwing vulnerability scanners at people and saying, scan and remediate. You want to do that asset risk assessment. You want to do that, uh, create that policy and procedure. This is the remediation and mitigation table. Um, we have the different severities of the vulnerabilities on the left-hand side. Um, you've got your remediation requirements, you've got your in-scope assets and your out-of-scope assets. Um, those are all part of the table. Those are the people that are involved uh, as far as um, uh, the actual approvals goes um, for who's accepting the risk. So if a vulnerability is not going to get 
Um, you've got, uh, you know, not getting remediated. You have your exception approvals for both in scope and out of scope assets. These are very important. These are the people that you're going to go to and say, hey, Mrs. Chief Compliance Officer, or Ms. Uh, Director of Operations, we can't remediate this vulnerability because it will break stuff. It'll break applications, and this is not uncommon where a patch will break something. And so you need that, um, you know, that that approval, that signature of that person defined in the policy that says this person is the only person that can write an exception for this or an accepted risk, right? So if they're not going to get remediated, these are the people that signs off on it. And then do you stop there? No, of course you don't. You want to put in some sort of mitigating control. If you can't patch the vulnerability, you need some sort of mitigating control that will be put in place in the case that that vulnerability is exploited. All right. Um, I'm going to quickly just switch back here um, and check on all of you, make sure audio is coming through. Uh, see if we have any questions. Albert, am I okay on audio and video feed? Everything's good? No choppiness? We're all good? Everything sounds just perfect as it should be. Awesome! Oh, wait. <laughs> Wrong one. Yay! Okay, so um, we've just covered remediation and mitigation. Let's go ahead and talk about the assessment phase. This is the actual um, putting... Uh, you know, putting the, this is brass tacks, putting pedal to the metal, where you're defining the target assets based on your risk assessment output, uh, and then performing scanning and then reporting on those vulnerabilities. Not much magic sauce here, nothing terribly exciting to talk about. This is where you're actually doing the vulnerability assessment. So next you're going to talk about the actual remediation phase. We're going to do the actual remediation. This is the act phase, where you're you're remediating the critical vulnerabilities on high risk assets first, right? Again, avoiding the the um, low risk or you know the things that you don't really care about uh, as much as you care about the high risk assets. Uh, then you're going to remediate the critical vulnerabilities on remaining assets. Now, what's a critical vulnerability? There's a lot of people. There's a religious debate over the you know applicability or relevance of CVSS scores today. Uh, a lot of people believe that CVSS scores are just rubbish. They're just garbage. Um, you know, my point on this is really simple. If the vulnerability allows remote code execution, like if it's if there's if it's RCE capable, if a vulnerability, if an exploit has been published, if it's available on exploit DB, or you know, if there's a Metasploit module for it, uh, those are critical vulnerabilities to me. Those are vulnerabilities that need to be patched first. And I always patch the high risk assets first. Next, you, I would patch the critical vulnerabilities on all of the remaining assets. The high, medium, and low, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm, I've I been doing this for so long. I There's a lot of people that may disagree with me. I know that they say that those vulnerabilities are important because they could be used is a chain as part of your kill chain to lead up to what the actual um, objective is for the adversary. I, I don't know. I don't even really. I think it's a waste of paper. I think it's a waste of bandwidth I, I, for vulnerability scanners to even report on things like low vulnerabilities. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I think it should be there. It, it should be documented and it should be available if you want to pull it up. Uh, actually reporting on it, it's just a waste of time. Um, <clears throat> I really think that the only thing you should be focused on are critical vulnerabilities because there's so much other things, so many other things that need to be done. Um, so that's how I define a critical vulnerability. Again, you may disagree with me. I'm totally fine with that. But, um, you know, maybe there's some high vulnerabilities that are important to patch. But uh, you know, again, I mean, I mean, I, I definitely, I'm not saying to ignore the vulnerabilities where there's no exploit published. Um, if if it allows a remote code execution, just because there's no exploit published for it doesn't mean you shouldn't patch it. Um, you know, vulnerability management, patch management is all very important. I'm just giving you a prioritized roadmap here of where you should concentrate first. So you guys hire 
guys and gals, you hire that outsourced penetration tester. They come in and they give you this big book uh, of vulnerability scan results. And you're saying, what the hell do I do with this? Well, take the vulnerabilities that the pen tester exploited to gain their foothold and lateral movement and pivot around and, and patch those first. And then, you know, put in your mitigating controls, which we'll talk about. Implement security controls to mitigate against identified threats. Again, lateral movement. Um, these can be things like decoy technology. I'm starting a brand new uh, campaign, content management, uh, content marketing campaign on decoy technology. Uh, companies like Elusive Networks, where their bread and butter is, you know, causing that red team to fail uh, on their objectives. Being able to detect lateral movement through deception. And I'm not talking about honeypots. Get that out of your mind. I'm talking about deception technology. Uh, so I just published a blog this morning. So take a look at it I, I where I talk about deception technology uh, and how it works, as well as MITRE SHIELD. So we'll be doing a webinar on MITRE SHIELD. We'll be talking about that. We'll also be talking about deception technology like Elusive. So definitely take a look at that blog and check out uh, that vendor. It's, a, it's pretty cool stuff. So again, reassess. Uh, once you've identified your high-risk assets, the risk assessment, once you've defined a risk treatment plan, once you've done your vulnerability scanning, once you've identified the critical vulnerabilities on your high-risk assets and remediate them, then you want to re-scan. You want to reassess the attack surface. You want to reassess the contested space, right? Uh, more military vernacular. Um, Rescan the assets and then validate the scan results. Make sure that your efforts to patch indeed worked. Right, uh, Caroline, I'm sure can talk about this to the end of time because she's so involved in ISMS program uh, development at our company. Um, one of the things that we see very often with clients is they'll they'll think they patch something. Um, you know, let's say for example they're trying to disable SSL encryption to move to TLS or whatever it may be, and and they think they turned it off in the Apache configuration. They think they disabled it. And, and it turns out that it, it isn't. It's still supported. So, you know, just because you think that you patched a vulnerability doesn't mean you actually patched it. So uh, that's a very important step is validating the actual scan and remediation effort. So next we're going to talk about tools. Um, you know, Again, we're we're product agnostic at Briar and Thorn, so I have no problem talking about some of the tools that are out there that we've seen that we that our customers use that uh, uh, they've found success with. You'll definitely want a vulnerability scanner. Now, you know the the age old question: Well, why pay for Nessus when I can use OpenVAS for free? Uh, OpenVAS is a great scanner. Uh, I've used it in the past. It's a great scanner. Um, you know, Nessus is not that expensive, which is nice. Uh, Nexpose is incredibly expensive. Uh, if you've got the budget for it, go for it. Um, there's Nessus Security Center. You know, all these are, again, there's, I think it's called Outpost 24. Um, there's a lot of great scanners out there. Uh, I don't think there's really been much innovation in this space um, over the last few years, which is probably why Tenable uh, sold, um, why they were acquired and just kind of got out of things. Um, I, I just, there isn't, how much more can you innovate in vulnerability scanning, right? Um, so you definitely need a vulnerability scanner. There's Qualys. Uh, Qualys is great. But you want to make sure that your scanner, that you're not only just performing ad hoc scanning with your scanner, but you're also performing routine scanning, setting up scheduled scans, uh, and then having, not just routinely scanning, but having a checkpoint where you meet with your stakeholders and your team uh, that I talked about creating and, and going over the new findings. New vulnerabilities are released daily. New zero day exploit came out while we were talking today. You know, they come out all the time. Um, so you wanna be constantly scanning just because you have all low and medium vulnerability severities um, right now, doesn't mean that you're not gonna have any critical findings tomorrow because of a new Windows vulnerability. 
Um, breach and attack simulation. This is where it starts to get really sexy. Uh, this is a, a relatively new product space. You've got multiple players in the space. You have the attack IQs of the world, simulate, Veridin. You have all these different breach and attack simulation solutions out there. Uh, XM Cyber, uh, which I've taken a look at. They're all really cool. Now, not all breach and attack simulation solutions are created equally. Like, Alyssa, what do you mean? Well, there's passive and there's active. So there's companies like, I want to say Simulate and XM Cyber have created actual exploitation modules where, uh, you know, instead of just identifying an attack path and harvesting credentials and having the agents move laterally and, and all that fun stuff and ultimately getting to the, the let's call it the PCI zone, uh, it will actually exploit the vulnerabilities it finds. Um, I don't know. I, you know, the jury is out on on the viability of that uh, and whether or not CISOs are comfortable with something like that. But if you think about it, that's what penetration testers do during a pen test. I think a lot's changed with CISOs these days. I feel like I feel like today that you know people are a lot less reticent than they were, you know. 20 years ago, for example, 20 years ago, CISOs would be very apprehensive to let their MSSP log in and perform threat hunting or, you know, doing MDR. And that's actually a thing today. CISOs are like, you know what? Uh, there is no such thing as prevention today. Uh, that's not a thing. It's not realistic. They will get in. And it's all about lowering that mean time to detection or MTTD and mean time to response. So we have this expensive MSSP that we've hired. Let's just give them the keys to come in and fix this stuff. You know, uh, we're getting all these tickets raised by our MSSP to remediate these issues and clean this malware or, you know, clean the spyware off of a machine it, when they could just log in and do it. Right. So, you know, I think the the jury has come back on that debate and, and the court of public opinion uh, has weighed in and said, yes, this is OK. So I think, you know, um, today, I think we're seeing this sort of change where CISOs are becoming comfortable with something like that, where they'll roll out a breach and tech simulation solution that's constantly running these uh, these attack scenarios and producing findings and they're okay with it exploiting the vulnerabilities they find so you have passive and active <coughs> excuse me uh solutions like attack iq uh those don't do actual exploitation and then you have solutions like xm cyber and i think simulate that's what the c um does exploitation so it's really up to your risk appetite um but definitely 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 if you are working on your budget for 2021. You should be budgeting for breach and attack simulation and decoy technology. We'll talk about that in the next webinar. But breach and attack simulation, it's it's so important in addition to the ad hoc scanning. What's neat about breach and attack simulation is that you don't get that typical 600 process report with it. Um, or any report with it uh, that's full of thousands of vulnerabilities that you don't know where to f where to start. Baz will produce like a one to two page report. It's really sick. It's 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 totally epic. There's it's it's a a prioritized list of what the Baz solution leveraged in order to gain domain admin or enterprise admin in your environment. How it was able to breach the PCI environment or cartel their data environment, what vulnerabilities it exploited along the kill chain to get there. Those you better damn well <laughs> remediate first. If your Baz solution used gave you a list of vulnerabilities that it it exploited to get there, um, maybe you have a flat network you need to fix. Maybe you need to be implementing micro segmentation, uh, you know, with something like stealth from Unisys or you know, you need to be implementing vacles at the very least, whatever, uh, you know, get away from that whole flat network thing, but definitely use it as a prioritized remediation list 
of vulnerabilities. And just so for those of you, for your edification on what exactly these things look like with Baz, this is a screenshot from XM Cyber. And this is the battleground. The battleground is basically your network environment where you have these enclaves, right? And I'm always saying this, what can be built by humans can be broken by humans, meaning that we as humans are, we're, we're fallible. We're not infallible at all, and we make mistakes. And so with breach and attack simulation, you can identify human errors, just like with uh, companies like Elusive or Deception Technology, you can identify shadow admin accounts, admin accounts that you didn't know existed uh, that are in the Active Directory environment and have enterprise admin or can get you enterprise admin that you didn't know about. Same thing with Baz. You know, you thought that this host in this enclave in New York couldn't talk to the other enclaves, couldn't talk to the other network uh, blocks, and they can. And the breach and attack simulation solution gave you how it, it actually went from host to host uh, in order to pivot around and move laterally within the environment. Imagine combining this with a decoy technology like Elusive, where you know, you're know you identifying that pivoting and actually testing your security controls. I would say that you know, breach and attack simulation is very much like a, a test-centric security model where you're testing your security controls to make sure that they're configured properly, to make sure that, well, I thought that I had implemented micro segmentation uh, I guess I did it because this host in New York is talking to a secure zone um, uh, enclave that's also talking to hosts in Europe um, you know it's it's just it gives you an opportunity to really identify uh, where you have gaps in your security controls where you have gaps in your your um, network infrastructure that you thought wasn't flat. Uh, here's a screenshot from Samir. Look how sexy these screenshots are. I mean, these tools. I gotta say, like, when when I when I started my first company, actually my second company, Applied Watch, uh, and we were building the UI, we never had access to building GUIs as sexy as this. This is really cool looking. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen Dark Trace. Uh, it's an NDR tool it, that is you know you're flying around within this 3D world. It's really it's really epic. It's totally sick. Um, so this is simulate uh, again. This is a breach and attack simulation tool, uh, and I do want to mention that none of the vendors I mentioned today are actually sponsoring this webinar. Um, I'm just giving you guys, guys and gals, solution ideas. I'm giving you vendor product ideas uh, to look at um, in in trying to construct your uh, vulnerability management program. Uh, so this is simulate. Again, it's the same concept. It, it allows you to identify, um, you know, attack paths within your network and different vulnerabilities available for exploitation uh, in order to reach uh, the goal on objectives. So one of the things that I love about webinars is when they make tools and templates available. So on Briar and Thorn, we're going to be setting up a resources section where, surprise, Caroline, <laughs> didn't talk to you about this first, um, but uh, we're going to be creating a download section where you can download a vulnerability management program policy template. Um, this is based on the ISO 27001 2013 standard. I don't think it's been updated since then. Um, I don't think, is there, Caroline, a new ISO 27001? Um, so we're going to be making this template available for all of you to download. Um, definitely hack it up and, and make it yours. Uh, you know, add to it, make it better. Uh, and, you know, knowledge should be shared. I'm a big believer in that, not just sold. Um, there's definitely, comp we, we as companies need to keep our lights on, but I, I'm really big on sharing knowledge and sharing templates and sharing tools uh, that will help defenders against the adversary. So with that, that is the end of our webinar and you guys survived it. So uh, let's go ahead and answer some questions uh, from the audience. Which oh, there are a few. Oh, good. That means people were actually paying attention. <laughs> of course they were. <laughs> there you go. The first one, anonymous. So uh, what would you recommend as far as cadence for scanning? 
Um, that's a great question. Uh, that's going to be dependent on the organization, the environment. I would definitely recommend raising that to the team that you guys form in your organization. Um, I, I, at Briar and Thorn, we recommend quarterly. Um, you can do it biannually, but I definitely feel like if you were to only do scanning once a year, you're going to be missing a lot of vulnerabilities that are going to be published and exploits that are going to be published during the course of the year. I would My cadence that I usually recommend is an annual penetration test and quarterly vulnerability scanning. So, you know, one of the things that we've run into, of course, in, in our organization is running into clients where, you know, they'll say, hey, look, you know, <laughs> we haven't gotten around to remediating the vulnerabilities from last year, so you might find a lot of the same findings, just a heads up. Um, so, you know, definitely be cognizant of that, but I definitely would recommend that everyone uh, scan at least quarterly. If you can get away with you know, monthly or every other month and great, um, but I would definitely recommend quarterly. Great answer, Alyssa. There you go, another one. What is your opinion of CVSS versus CVE? Oh, um, I don't know. I, I'm not a, I'm not really drunk on the CVSS Kool-Aid, um, you know, or CVE scores or CVSS scores. <sighs> okay, so there's definitely math behind that. Um, one of the things that, I do want to mention is there was this solution, and I can't remember the name of it right now, so it's not going to help you guys much, but if you Google it, I'm sure you'll find it. They were using machine learning. So ML has completely transformed the cybersecurity landscape, right? Um, and one of the things that I can tell you is there's a solution that came out that's using ML models to predict the future weaponization of vulnerabilities. And it gives, so it gives you a prioritized list of vulnerabilities to remediate based on the likelihood that it will become weaponized and to, and used in either malware, spyware, or, you know, name your pick, you know, a spray kit, or, you know, just a straight up exploit, like a Python exploit. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but, you know, again, it doesn't rely on CVSS scores or CV. I, 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 I think it's rubbish. I think scoring... CVSS scoring is rubbish. I, I really just try and make things simple. You know, life is complicated enough. Our jobs is complicated enough where we have a, we don't, there's no point in over engineering something or making something more complicated than it has to be. We're only going to remediate CVSS scores 3.79 and above. Uh, no, come on. Uh, in my opinion, you know, if there's an exploit published for it, if it's critical, if it allows RCE, remediate it first. Plain and simple, right? Plain and simple. It's 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 not it's not really hard to try and figure out or calculate a score um, around. Hey, it's either critical or not. <laughs> and every vulnerability scanner out there typically has low, medium, high, and critical. And so, uh, you know, if it doesn't have critical, of course, then just do the highs. But I really wouldn't waste your time going around remediating low or remediating medium or trying to define a CVSS score for your organization that you're going to that you're going to remediate above that score. I would just say critical or not, exploit or not, done. <laughs> Move on. Amazing. There you, um, another one. What do you think about open source vulnerability scanners? Before I answer that, um, Anonymous also just posted a statement that um, ISO has just been updated to 2018, or was updated in 2018. Thank you for that. It's been a while. I haven't actually done anything with ISO in a while. But um, yeah, so ISO 27001, 2018. That, was, that, that is correct. Thank you for correcting me, uh, Anonymous. Um, yeah, so open source vulnerability scanners. Um, I'm a huge proponent of open source. You know, I, I'm I'm drunk on the security onion Kool Aid. You know, if if you can do something with open source, uh, Caroline, what was that other? Um, there's a new EDR tool I think that's free and open source. Um, Wazoo, Kazoo, yeah, yeah Wazoo, Wazoo. Um, I think that's free and open source, right? That's a freemium model. Uh, but I, if you can do something with open source, do it. 
right? So, I mean, if you're, but obviously if you have the budget to buy something, then buy something. But, you know, if, if there's something free and open source available, go for it. Like OpenVest, great tool. At the end of the day, it's not like you're going to, you know, you're not going to be as effective in finding vulnerabilities if you're using something that's open source versus commercial. There's a lot of great tools. A lot of people don't know this. OWASP publishes tools. There's OWASP Zap. There's they're, they're, um, one of their tools, I can't remember the name of it, actually is a free open source API fuzzer that you can use. So there's, you know, there's a lot of great open source security tools out there that you guys can be using and gals can be using. Uh, don't just feel like, you know, you're you're not elite unless, you know, you're using a commercial off the shelf tool. Uh, there's some great anonymous tools out there. Great answer, Alyssa. From John, breach and attack simulations often are expensive. There are several projects open source that run scripts to do what these platforms promise. What are your thoughts on this? Is there value to this? Um, okay, so uh, ADD here, I'm the ADD poster child. Um, I do want to make a mention. Um, yeah, I do want to say one thing about OpenVest. OpenVest is actually a spin-off from Nessus before Ron Gula and Renaud Dereisen, there's a reason. Uh, formed and commercialized Tenable. So what happened was this community of, of developers got together and said, hey, look, you know, Ron is forming Tenable. Renaud is going over to the company. Um, it looks like Nessus may no longer be free and open source anymore. So what they did was they spun off this, they forked off this branch, this tool called OpenVest. And I think it actually had a different name before that. I can't remember. But um, they settled on OpenVest. Uh, and so it's actually a fork off of Nessus, the original open source Nessus project. And people are developing new plugins for OpenVest all the time. It's not like a dead project. It's people are creating vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerability plugins and checks for OpenVest uh, as a commercial, as an open source alternative to the commercial stuff. So there's really no excuse any of you have if you say, you know, I can't afford a vulnerability scanner. Um, Alberto, breach and attack simulation. Uh, great question. Yes, I love Baz. I'm a huge believer, and I'm totally drunk on the Baz Kool Aid. Um, I really don't think your vulnerability management program is complete without a Baz solution. Again, this is not sponsored by anyone. Um, I just really am a big believer in it. I've played with it. I've sat at the console and moved the mouse around and used it. It's cool stuff. Um, it's it's really neat because it gives you the ability to really test your EDR. It gives you the ability to really test your NDR. It gives you the ability to really test your firewalls and your vacals and your micro segmentation. If you really thought your network wasn't flat and it was segmented, Baz is a great way to actually uncover the dark parts of your network that you that you thought or didn't know about, that you thought weren't there and didn't know about, uh, it's a great way to do that. Um, you know, as far as the best you know uh, bad solution out there, again, it's going to come to your risk appetite. Are you okay with something like XM Cyber exploiting vulnerabilities it finds? It can be turned off. Let me let me make that clear. It's not like use it or lose it. It, those that functionality can be disabled, um, but I really don't think, in my humble opinion, that a vulnerability management program is complete without a bad solution. The, you, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a new and very exciting time in cybersecurity right now with machine learning and a lot of these other advancements in uh, different branches of artificial intelligence. Uh, the days of signatures are gone. The days of antivirus DAT files are gone and have been replaced by ML models. And vulnerability management is no different. A lot of the vulnerability management tools today use ML models. As a matter of fact, breach and attack simulation tools are built on ML models. And so it really gives us the ability beyond human capacity using AI or a branch of AI uh, like ML uh, to do what we previously weren't able to do or see. Um, I really believe that you know these new product categories being created, whether it's you know Baz or deception technology, all of these new product categories are very quickly 
going from a nice to have to a need to have. It's really just, again, security and layers like an onion. Build security in layers outside from the inside out from the things you're trying to protect. Identify it, the high value assets via risk assessment that you want to protect that are the center of gravity for your organization and build security control like an onion around it. So you've got your vulnerability scanner, you've got BAS, you've got your deception technology to identify lateral movement and pivoting. You've got your NDR uh, as well. You've got your EDR and you have your SIM, SOAR, and possibly now the discussion and debate around whether or not SIM and SOAR have produce the return on investment we expected. And a lot of organizations now and CISOs I'm talking to are throwing their SIM solution out and replacing it with, thing with things like log analytics, like Elastic and Elk Stack. So uh, something to think about. Amazing, Alyssa. Listen, uh, Bernardo just asked this, but I'm pretty sure uh, you answered already. Hello, Alyssa. Are there any best tools open source out there? If yes, which one would you recommend? Um, oh. sure you if you oh. want to say something else, go no, ahead. No, I did not. I did not say that. Um, I'm not, you know, Caroline, keep me honest here, but I don't think there's an open source BAS tool out there. I, I, this is a group for if any of you out there who are listening are developers uh, and, and want to start up an open source BAS project, um, I'm not aware of one. That's a great question, Bernardo. Well, I, there's a couple of projects in GitHub um, really? that, you could, that you could take a look at. Um, they do essentially what an, a BAS platform does. Um, I, it is specified, so it's not as a BAS platform. So it is specified, for example, if you're talking about Linux systems versus Windows systems, and they're more segmented. However, there there are a couple of options that you could take a look at. Yeah, and thank you for pointing that out. If everyone will take a look at something called Infection Monkey, there's a there's a company called Gardacore, and it looks like that they have actually open sourced. Um, something called Infection Monkey. I freaking love that name. That's amazing. Anything dealing with monkeys is amazing. One of these days, I'm going to talk my wife into letting me buy a pet monkey. I want a pet monkey in overalls. That would be amazing. Amazeballs. So there is this open source bad solution from Gardacore called Infection Monkey. And it looks like you can, it's a free download. You can download it today. Um, automatic attack simulation, continuous and safe assessments, and actionable recommendations. I, you know, this is a commercial company though. I don't know if it's a freemium model. Yeah, it looks like a freemium model. So Infection Monkey is free. Um, it doesn't look like, you know, then it looks like there's a, a cost to vulnerability scanner and pen testing. Maybe that's, uh, okay, maybe they're comparing Infection Monkey with scanners and pen testing. So it looks, I don't know, this looks legit. Um, definitely, if any of you guys want to go download this and, and, and check this out, I might do it. This looks like webinar worthy. It looks like, uh, you know, a live stream worthy tool to take a look at. This is really cool. Um, I haven't checked out the GitHub projects that Caroline has mentioned. Um, top 20. Also, um, if I'm not mistaken, and, and you could take a look, um, no before, seven minutes. Stephen Mitnick has that company, and it has something that Kevin. could be classified. Sorry, um, something that could be classified free Kevin, as, free Kevin. <laughs> as BAS, which is for ransomware purposes. So it'll let you know um, if it'll okay. it, it'll do a simulation on a ransomware. Um, so that is under that round, and I believe that is open. So just take a look and. Yeah, you know, I do. I, I want to hand it to vendors. You know, this is really cool. This is, you know, the the days of, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe this started with Red Hat. I don't remember. Anyway, I I think it's neat that companies are now coming up and saying, you know, we're gonna we're gonna contribute to the open source community. We're gonna make uh, an open source project. Use our our resources, our dollars to to develop an open source platform for this to give back to the open source community and i love that god bless gardacore oh uh, maybe i'll do uh, maybe i'll have them on night tv and interview uh some of the people over at gardacore that's that's really cool i uh, that's neat to look at um very cool awesome so next question yeah another one um 
we have a late attendee who just asked, um, have you had any experience in using Defender ATP TVM for vulnerability management? No, I've heard of it. Uh, I've definitely not used it. Uh, I, one of these days, I, I do need to do a bake off of the the most you know the three top vulnerability scanners out there and, and compare and contrast. Um, I, as all of you know, I'm also the principal and partner over at Night Inc. and I I do content creation for cybersecurity vendors, so I get a you know, hands-on view of a lot of the latest security controls and tools out there. Um, but I, I, I've i heard of that company and tool, but I just, I've, I've never played with it. So if you have any feedback, definitely drop me a line on LinkedIn or something and let me know about it. But I've, I, if, if you've used it and, uh, you know, you've identified some uh, differences between that and things like Nessus or Nexpose. I, I used to use Nexpose. I know I'm knocking uh, Rapid7 a lot right now. Uh, the, you know, God bless them. They're great. You know, they they've created some great solutions and platforms. Everything's you know really moving um, towards this new model. Vulnerability scanners are no longer just scanners anymore. Um, but you know, one of the things everything's like MDR now, right? Um, but one of the things with Rapid Seven and Next was Next was is a very powerful scanner. It's very cool. It's got some really cool bells and whistles and and you know sexy flair to it. Uh, but it's it's just un to me. If you know CEO of Rapid Seven, if you're listening, uh, there's no reason to charge that much for a vulnerability scanner. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you look at this like I I don't know. Carolina was it a hundred times more expensive than other scanners? It's ri it's ridiculous. I just made that number up. But I mean, you know, it's 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 ridiculously expensive compared to other tools like Nessa. I think you can get what a Nessa scanning agent license for 700 bucks or something like that. Caroline, it's cheap. It's cheap. There's no reason to spend that much on a scanner. Anyway, just my opinion. So we're just shy of the hour, 9 a.m. over here in the West Coast. So I think this is going to be the last question. Um, uh, Anonymous says, hey, Lisa, do you, do you know any company, don't need the name, who's using Splunk for VM? And it really works good. But he then uh, uh, posted another question and he said, he or she said, I mentioned Splunk, but I've seen you work with Elastic. Do you use Elastic for VM and or any other purposes? Oh, man. Okay, so, ooh. <laughs> My wife's like, Alyssa, don't say it. Don't say it. Okay, I hate Splunk. Let me just make that abundantly clear um, with you, plus. I hate Splunk. Splunk kicked me out of their dot com conference in 2019 and wouldn't let me in uh because i okay i was just just for background i was an analyst at the time and usually conferences let analysts in for free they don't charge them and splunk wouldn't let me in because i didn't have a paid ticket anyway i hate splunk and they're ridiculously expensive um so i will never ever say anything nice about splunk i'm sorry i hate them um okay with that aside, yes, I definitely recommend Elastic. Um, but okay, look, I, for those of you who don't know uh, about this about me, uh, I really um, am a Debbie Downer on SIM solutions. I really don't believe that they've produced the ROI. They're extremely expensive. There's a reason why ArcSight doesn't really exist anymore. Um, but, you know, I just really think that the days of SIM are gone. I think they never lived up to their dream. Um, you, you know, you've got now this new product category of source solutions, which are awesome and make SIM, you know, more actionable with playbooks and are great. And then you have the logarithms of the world that said, you know, we're going to take these two similar product categories and we're going to make this one sort of amazing thing, um, you know, uh, simplify, it's sort of doing the same thing where it's kind of a hybrid SOAR and SIM. I don't know. I, I'm not... I, I'm a big Elastic girl. I love Elastic. I drink. The, I'm drunk on the Elastic Kool Aid. You guys can go read my article out there on my on my on Medium or on my LinkedIn post feed about um, the death of CM. Um, I also talk about the rise of SOAR, but also, the, you know, check out my YouTube channel on my videos and interviews with the folks from Elastic, like James Spiteri. Um, they're just they're doing some wicked cool stuff over at Elastic that can't be ignored. And, you know, when you're talking about an organization, an age where 
organizations are having to decide what they send to their CM because their CM is so expensive on ingest costs where they're charging so much money for ingest on these events and logs that they the, their half their environment isn't being sent to the CM because they can't afford it. Shame on us. Shame on us for getting to a point where organizations like Splunk and other companies have made it so expensive that the CISO has to make a decision on what they send and don't send to their CM. Um, I believe that we are now in this age of massive data lakes where CM would back, you know, powered by relational databases that eventually become too slow to run queries against. Uh, really just, sorry, I don't know who that's calling. Um, that's a call for the sales line at Briar and Thorn, Caroline. So you might want to have someone get on that. Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely um, say the answer to your question is elk. The answer to your question is elastic. I'm not a Splunk girl at all. Anyway, hope that answers your question. Everyone, if anyone out there is drunk on the, the Splunk Kool-Aid and loves Splunk, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you, but I, I'm very opinionated and I keep it real. That's what you guys love about me though, right? All right. Actually, that's it. There are some, uh, a few uh, Splunk fans, but mostly Elastic, so they're with you on the same boat. Yay! Okay, so, all right. Look, Splunk is a great tool. I, I I just I personally couldn't care less about Splunk, but I mean it's a great tool. You know, to me it's a syslog server on steroids. All right, there you go. I said it. Um, but yeah, uh, no offense to those of you who love Splunk. It's a great tool, but I'm just not a fan. Not a fan. So yeah, I think that's about it. I mean, uh, guys are really invested in getting to know more. So if anyone wants to know more information, have some questions, you can pin up Alyssa, uh, either her email or on LinkedIn. I think she prefers LinkedIn, right, Alyssa? Or even Twitter, right? Yeah, I, I'm more, I think I'm more responsive on LinkedIn. Um, you can DM me on Twitter, sure. Um, definitely connect with me. Yeah, and also, you know, if you want to learn more about Brian Thorne, we're doing some cool stuff, you know. Check us out, BrianThorn.com. Also, this you know, uh, subscribe and and follow me on YouTube. Also, uh, you know, we do these webinars regularly. We're going to be doing more. We're going to set up this resources section for free template downloads on our website. Um, so there's a lot of cool things going on. So check us out. Yeah, actually, uh, for just to, uh, to end this, thank you so much, guys, uh, for investing your time. And we know time is money. And this hour in the morning, I'm pretty sure you all have a lot of things to do. So really, we appreciate it so much. And as Alyssa said, there are a few subjects that are still coming before the end of the year. So yeah, we'll be posting it on the Brian, Brian Thorne website and on the LinkedIn page. Alyssa will be us with us for a few more webinars. So yeah, just keep tracing us. Yay, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining. We will have a recording of this uh, webinar available here soon. Uh, so thank you very much for joining. And I hope you guys enjoyed the entertainment along with my dancing. Have a great day, everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other.